Warning, the following podcast may contain graphic content, language, sexual nature that some may find offensive. Listening discretion is advised. Hey everybody, it's Tommy Canale and welcome back to Before the Lights Podcast, the show that tells you how they made their mark. She's an Amazon best-selling author of Crushing It, an accredited CrossFit coach, global entrepreneur, athlete, who's a certified personal trainer and Olympic lifting coach. She's the first Australian women's arm wrestling champion, a three-time international bodybuilding competitor who has appeared on Jimmy Kimmel Live and The Doctors. The woman with the world's most deadliest thighs. That's right. You heard me correctly because this chick is a true badass. Please welcome to the show, Courtney Olson. Courtney, welcome to Before the Lights. Thank you, Tommy. How are you? I am well. Excited to have you on. I want to give a shout out to a former guest, Steve Cook, who connected us and said, hey, you got to get Courtney on your show. So I want to say thanks to Steve. (laughs) Steve's a legend. (laughs) He is a legend. Let me start here with you. You've been obsessed with muscles since the age of seven as you admired your older brother. And then in college, you started lifting. What was it about muscles that just got your attention? You know, that is a great question. It's kind of loaded. It's really a long answer. Uh, Normally, you know, in a short form, I attribute it to my brother, which, as you said, you know, that's what I I say publicly in a lot of interviews because, you know, you keep it short and simple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my he's eight years my senior and and growing up he was he was my idol and so whenever we had a little home garage gym and whenever he and my dad would go out there i'd tag along and you know wanted to do all the things that he did and you know whether it was basketball or uh we grew up in the country and so we had 40 acres and we would do things like um get cardboard boxes and fly off the (laughs) side of the mountain you know, in the middle of the summer, because we had a bunch of wheat grass. <laughs> so, you know, I, I often use that as an answer. But do you want the long answer? Yeah, give me the long answer. Let's let's get into it. <laughs> okay, let's go deep. All right. All right. So we're going to start out there. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I love I love getting deep because, yeah, I feel like, you know, the world in general is, is too, not shallow, but, you know, we often don't share a lot of deep things. And I think that's what makes us human, you know, and a hundred percent agree with you. And when you can open up and just keep it real and own your story, every aspect of it, it's, it's super empowering. So long story short, kind of short, I was roughly what? 35. Is that right? I'm not great at math. So for anybody young who's listening to this, you can still be an awesome CEO and super <laughs> successful and count on your fingers. <laughs> we'll say we'll say 30 something. Yeah, 30 something. I was in my <laughs> early 30s and I did my first session with a guy in subconscious psychology and um he was a former national he was a former rugby player, professional rugby player in Australia and you know, he wasn't like some um, wizard wearing a white robe or anything like that. He was just a totally normal guy and a former athlete. And he started talking to me about this concept of subconscious psychology. And he mentioned there was like a meditative process in my whole adult life. I've been working on trying to, and there is no try. I just want to say that I always catch myself when I say that word, say there's no try. You're either pregnant or you're not. But <laughs> I've been attempting to incorporate a daily meditation practice and failing at it. And he said, you know, this has got an element of meditation. And I'm like, cool. That's all I heard. I said, sign me up. So after we got done with CrossFit one day, we went back to my place and he came and we we did this session and essentially he got me in this meditative state and you connect to your subconscious and whatever comes up is the the answer and he asked me he said all right what is your number one limiting belief and i said i am fat and i've i've wasn't surprised right so i'm in this meditative state i'm not really thinking i'm more in this i'm observing what's going on and i said the words i am fat and i was like okay 
Sure. Because that's been a driving belief for me since I was a little girl, you know, grew up with big legs. And I'm sure we'll get into that here momentarily. But I said, I'm fat. And he said, OK, tell me a little bit more about that. And I sat there and all of a sudden the word pedophile came out of my mouth. Mm. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. And I, I was like, I have no idea what that's about. And he said, OK, well, elaborate. Tell me a little bit more about that. And I sat there for probably like eight seconds or so, Tommy, and it was the longest eight seconds of my life. And um, I sat there and then all of a sudden the words came out of my mouth and I said, um, growing up, my best friend's older brother, Gabe, took me off into the woods and touched me in some inappropriate places. And I was still, again, sitting there not thinking, right? But I was like, and, and unattached to what I said, but I was like, wow. Okay. And just sat there. He brought me out of this meditative state and we debriefed. And I said, my gosh, I completely forgot about that happening. I remembered it one time as an adult when I had turned 21 and I went to rehab. And um, when I was in rehab, I had a moment of clarity and I vaguely remembered this incident happening. And of course I tried to ask my mom, but my mom was a, an extreme alcoholic, right? So the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. And she's like, yeah, I kind of remember. She remembered getting in a fight with my best friend's mom about it. Cause he did end up going to juvenile hall, you know, cause he was 16 at the time. And um, yeah, I, you know, I completely forgot about it since that point. So we go back into this meditative state and you connect to your, higher self, which is another term for your soul, your intuition, your um, consciousness, you know, people have different words for it, right? But your your higher self. And um, I said, Okay, well, what was you supposed to ask? What was the, the message? What was, you know, what was the lesson in that? And what I got back was that that was the first time I had disconnected from my intuition. And as a result from being violated, I created this image of myself needing to be ripped up and strong in order to feel worthy and protected and safe. And so learning that was incredible because I thought, gosh, what has been my driving force my entire life to to be muscular, right? Like what what the what is this? Because I've often looked at it and I'm like, it's very interesting because if I didn't see visible muscle, I felt like a fat, disgusting piece of SHIT. Mm. And you can say you know, those words on my show. Okay, cool. <laughs> I was going to ask before we started and I completely forgot. But yeah, I, I felt like a fat, disgusting piece of shit. Like if I couldn't see visible muscle. And um, so that didn't cure my body dysmorphia, right? Like I, I still battled with it for another eight years, really until I was about 38. And, um, you know, what it did do though, is just gave me insight and understanding myself better and being like oh my gosh that's that's why that happened because you know our our brains are so powerful and very few of us stop to actually understand how the mind works and the you know what the subconscious is actually capable of doing and that it's actually 40 million times more powerful than our conscious mind you know when we say humans only use three to four percent of their brain you know so, so it's in that context mm -hmm. and um you know, realizing how much our childhood from ages zero to eight years old, some say seven, there's, you know, different schools of thoughts, but that we're not fully conscious yet. And that's when we create a majority of our limiting beliefs about ourselves, a majority of our beliefs, period. And of those 70% or more are limiting, meaning that they're negative and not serving us a, a good purpose. So it was, it was quite eye opening you know, to understand that. Yeah. And be like, oh, my gosh, you know, and especially in this day and age when, you know, we we read about um, all of the human trafficking and, you know, all these crimes against children. And you think like, oh, my gosh, that's that's a real thing. It wasn't just something random that I experienced, you know. So um, but yeah, it was it was very, very powerful. It was a very powerful experience. I love this. And, I love that yeah. we're going deep. This is yeah, right off the bat. We're like eight minutes in. Going <laughs> I love getting into deep, real stimulating conversations. So let me ask you this, because something popped in my head when you were talking about that. Then how did you learn to love yourself or do you love yourself these days? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say that it took me literally until 
So this is where my book actually ends. Like I said, I was 38 and it was a very gradual process. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done a bit of different modalities in terms of accessing, you know, the subconscious and, and rewiring new neural pathways. Cause it was, and it's almost like a distant memory, which is bizarre because it ruled my life for my entire life. You know, like anytime I'd eat something, I remember my husband took me to, Italy. So we went to Italy, Rome, South of France. Um, we, we went all around that area. And I mean, I couldn't even eat a piece of pizza. Like I, I maybe ate one piece of pizza the entire time we were over there, maybe one scoop of gelato, but with the pizza, you know, I'd sit there and dab off all the extra oil with a napkin. And as soon as I'd eat something, I'd sit there and be like, Oh my gosh, what, what am I going to do to burn these calories off? And it literally is all I would think about. Or if I, you know, there was a point where I was doing CrossFit, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Bikram yoga all in the same day, five days a week. Yeah, I was, it was nuts. Um, And I would go and get like frozen yogurt as a quote unquote treat. And I put like, you know, shaved almonds on it. And I'd be like, Oh my God, I had too many almonds. I'm going to get fat. And (laughs) You know, I'd start walking around the house and feeling my abs to make sure they were still there. I mean, it was it was wild. And, you know, not appreciating the fact that often as addicts, you know, we have some form of OCD. You know, it's just something in us that we we need to obsess on. So uh, it was it was a gradual process. Right. So I came off the back of um, a really hardcore methamphetamine addiction and, you know, that led to narcotics because after I got clean and sober off of drinking and using meth, I had like a two month period where I was clean and then I hurt my back wrestling. And I thought, all right, well, pain pills aren't my problem. And then I started taking pain pills and it was manageable for like the first year or so. And then of course it became unmanageable. And, you know, then my name was on the bottles, so I would start doctor shopping and using other things. Like I have a massive bunion on my foot from kicking the wall barefoot drunk when I was in college and got caught cheating on one of my boyfriends with my ex. (laughs) So I would wear like really tight shoes and then it would be bright red and I'd go into the podiatrist. I'd be like, oh my God, my foot's killing me, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) And I would just get refills. And then of course I was, you know, using pills with my mom because she was having a bunch of different surgeries. And, uh, it just, then, then that of course turned into Oxycontin and that was like a a six month, really fast downward spiral. And, um, you know, so from going from that to then into, um, training, right. So I use training as like my new addiction, if you will. And was training your like wake up moment to get out of narcotics and alcohol or no? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I was still, even when I was high on meth at three o'clock in the morning, I'd go into 24 hour fitness and do cardio, you know? So it it was like, I was, I was still training then, but this just was, uh, the, the thing to keep me sane, if you will. And, and to, to take it seriously. So it was actually when I decided to compete I was like, all right, I'm going to compete my first bodybuilding show. This will be a great reason for me to get clean. And it didn't quite work for the first I'd say three months, I I kept taking uh, narcotics. And then I started going to 12 step meetings and I was still high. I'd go like seven o'clock in the morning. I was still taking pills. So that's another important thing I always tell people. It's like, if you do have the desire to get clean and sober, you know, you just start showing up and you start getting the message little by little. And, you know, you can still be under the influence, although being under the influence under certain things makes it really difficult. Like if you go into a meeting hammered, you know, you're not going to really retain much information because I was super functional. You know, and that's even more dangerous at times because when you're really functional, you know, you, you put it off Mm -hmm. for longer, right? I never, I could always talk my way out of a ticket. You know, I I, um, was a criminal justice major at college. And so I, you know, had a great repertoire of (laughs) fancy words to say and things to talk about. And so I always managed to, you know, um, avoid getting in serious trouble, um, So yeah, it was, it was super fascinating, but it definitely became my, my new addiction. And, um, just because you put down the drugs and alcohol doesn't mean you're fixed. 
right? Like there's so much more work that has to be done. And I, I wasn't aware of that or I didn't want to accept it at the time. So again, I just used my body as a as something to control. Gotcha. So as an addict or an alcoholic, you're we're constantly trying to control the outcome of things, you know, whether it was the way your body looks or if the sun rises or not. So it was um it was quite a process. So to get to the stage where um I just kind of one day gradually waltzed into not giving a fuck mm. <laughs> and, it, and it took a while but uh it and again I, I put it down to like a number of different things like of doing um the subconscious psychology modality because there's neuro-linguistic programming nlp you know which tony robbins does there's eft like the tapping mm-hmm. um is it emdr or e- edmr emdr the rapid eye movement yep um Yeah. So there's a lot of different things, but I found site K worked the best for me, which is, um, you know, a a different modality that I, I absolutely had a lot of success with so much. So I even went out and became a master facilitator so I could help other people address their stuff. Right. Let me go on the heels of that. Somebody listening now that I'm sure there's listeners out there that are in the same thinking, the same thing here is I hate my body. I've never loved myself. What's your advice to those people on how to learn to love themselves? Number one thing I tell people is to be of service. So when we're so focused on our body and these external things, it's because we're not getting outside of ourselves. We're just stuck in our own head. And so by being of service to somebody else, A, you get to see that, you know, there are other people out there with struggles, oftentimes people that have real struggles. And I, not to say that body dysmorphia isn't a real struggle, but I'm, I mean, like tangible stuff, you know, people don't have transportation or, you know, they can't afford to pay their electricity bill or whatever the case might be. Um, You know, someone living with a, a really difficult, disability um you know and so i often say like this is a gold-plated problem and um not that it's not real though because there were plenty of times where you know it got me to the point where i was suicidal which in retrospect it's like how is that even possible you know i remember sitting on my closet and crying on the floor one day because i couldn't fit into any of my pants and i was just going to costco with my ex and it was like nothing fit and I, I just sat down on the floor. I'm just like, life isn't worth living. <laughs> you know, I don't even have any clothes I can fit into. And I was legitimately like questioning the purpose of life and not wanting to live. And I remember that like it was yesterday. And then when I look at it, I'm like, gosh, that is so bizarre. You know, like how, how we get so worked up and into these state of minds to to think that, you know, that was a real problem. It's like, screw it. Go out in your underwear. <laughs> That's what I do today. Don't have any pants. You know, um, I guess that is in part why I started a clothing line too. So I can always have something that fit me. <laughs> I, I, I live in spandex, Tommy. I'll tell you what. <laughs> you poor men are missing out. <laughs> Yoga pants are life. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I always tell people, you know, be of service because then it also gives you purpose. And I think that's, in my experience, the number one driving force behind depression and anxiety is not having a a sense of purpose. You know, so many of us get stuck in these nine to five jobs. We're afraid to chase our dreams. We're afraid to, you know, because we're afraid of failure. And um, the society that we live in here in the West, it's like, you know, we, we were like trapped in the matrix. So I do think since the pandemic, you know, one good thing that's come about from that is a lot of people did pick up their interests and in, and in try new things even though i said try is is a bad word earlier but in this instance it's okay but whether that again like yourself running a podcast or starting an etsy store or you know um trying a, a just a new line of work in general and, and starting to work for yourself so um but again being of service it just takes you out of your head gives you a purpose, makes you feel useful and it just fills your cup up, Mm -hmm. you know? So that was the, probably the number one thing for me was to learning to be there for other people and, um, not making it all about me. You know, I say failure F A I L stands for first attempt in learning. 
Yeah, that's a great acronym. That's that's brilliant. And the other thing I always say and believe in is you need to have body acceptance, but love yourself inside before you love yourself outside. Because you're yeah. never you're never going to be satisfied with the outside. But you can work on yourself internally. And if you work on yourself internally, people will see who the real you is and see that there's more beauty within than there is outside. Yep. hundred percent. Absolutely. Courtney, tell me this. How does a Craigslist ag for a muscular calf model lead you to bodybuilding? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. It, um, <laughs> Yeah, that, so I was actually bodybuilding at the time and I I was relatively new to the game. I mean, I'd, after I got to college, which was at 17, you know, I, I found my way into the weight room and my <laughs> range was very limited. So I didn't have anybody coaching me or showing me things. And of course we didn't have smartphones back then. So I wasn't on YouTube and all this stuff. Right. And so it was very limited, but when, once I did start, you know, bodybuilding, it, it, opened up a lot of new pathways, if you will. But this in particular, <laughs> finding that ad, because I, when I was younger, you know, I, to support my pill habit, of course, you know, I was um, would do like a lot of topless modeling or implied nude. So I was on Craigslist looking around for, for additional jobs because I was at the time an internet sales manager for like eight car dealerships. It was for a dealer <laughs> group in Northern California. And I absolutely hated it. I hated my job. And, um, so I was <laughs> scouting around on Craigslist and I saw that ad and it's like muscular calf video shoot. It was like a hundred dollars an hour or something. I was like, what is this? <laughs> this must be porn. So of course <laughs> I took a picture of my calves and sent it off to the guy. And next thing I knew he was up in my office, like the next day. And, um, he said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he, he kind of like explained to me what it was about. And I was still like, not quite getting it. <laughs> so anyway, when I actually went down to his place and, uh, I got the, the lowdown on this industry and this whole industry was the, I, you know, called the muscle kink industry. So, cause the difference between, I used to say muscle fetish, but come to find out a fetish is something that people need in order to, um, achieve sexual gratification or you know mm -hmm. they they need it in order to get off if you will to be whereas stimulated with, yeah <laughs> and whereas with the kink it's just you know something that someone is into right, right. it's right. not like the end of the world if they don't you know come across it or what have you so anyway I, yeah, discovered this whole world <laughs> where literally I would say in my experience one out of maybe six men are into something that's not mainstream, you know, or whatever we're led to think is attractive according to the matrix. Right. Mm -hmm. So big boobs and, you know, a tiny waist and blonde hair, whatever. So, I mean, I'm talking about like hairy armpits, no, no boobs, uh, big legs, strength, you know, and as a woman growing up in the nineties, that was not ever something that was a focal point of what was deemed beautiful or attractive, right? It was a size zero. It was Kate Moss. It was a thigh gap. And so to learn that there were, you know, tons of men and globally, it was a global phenomenon, if you will, uh, that are into strong women. Right. So I learned about this whole world of doing these random things to, um, demonstrate strength. So stuff called like lift and carry, where you pick guys up and carry them around, arm wrestling, wrestling, you know, and this is how I got into arm wrestling. So I, Australia's first female champion, uh, national champion. So I got into jujitsu. Uh, so I'm a Queensland state Brazilian jujitsu champion. And then, um, yeah, it, it was just mind blowing to me. So getting choked out between my legs. All right. That's how I started crushing watermelons. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. That's how that started. <laughs> yeah, it is. It was a whole whole chapter in my book. And you know, this guy wanted to wanted me to knock him out between my legs. And I was, of course, this was before I got clean this last time around. And so I had just taken like, I don't know how many Norcos, probably five. <laughs> I think I chewed up on the way down there. So I was pretty high. Like I said, it was very functional, but um I get to his office and he, you know, 
he said, oh, I brought some watermelons because he'd asked me, he's like, do you try crushing watermelons between your legs? I'm like, okay, sure. Why not? <laughs> and I, you know, I didn't really think twice about it. And then, so we started out and I had, he had these chairs in his office that were, you know, lined up next to each other. So I laid on them sideways and I put a figure four on him, which essentially, you know, is like a rear naked choke in MMA, but using your legs. And so I put the, you know, put my bottom leg around his neck and put the other one on top and started squeezing. And he told me too, he's like, I've only had two women bodybuilders knock me out in 20 years. And I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. Well, buckle up, bitch. <laughs> don't, give, don't give me a challenge. I'm not, I don't lose very well. So I'm not a good, not a good loser. So of course I, you know, went all out and boom, I hear this popping sound. And he slumps over, he's out. And I literally thought I broke his neck because it was, again, not, um, this was prior to the um, subconscious psychology session. So I would say at this point, this was the longest seven to eight seconds of my life. And he just, you know, I let go and I, I laid him back and I'm just sitting there staring at him, laying on the ground, no movement whatsoever. And I had knocked somebody, you know, I had a regular, I used to make videos with that. He loved to get knocked out and I'd <laughs> knock him out and boom, he'd wake right back up. And so watching him lay there, I'm like, <laughs> fuck, I look over in the corner, Tommy, cause he had, you know, that blue painters tarp. Yeah. 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 So he had one of those in the corner for me to crush the watermelons on. And I'm like, Am I supposed to roll his body up in this tarp? Am I on pump? Like, you know, because I'm quite loaded at the point. And I'm like, oh, my God, I, I fucking killed this man. How am I going to explain this? Sure enough, he started snoring. He had like some foam in the corner of his mouth. And I'm like, oh, my God. He opens his eyes. He's like, oh, oh, oh my God, that was amazing. And I'm like, ha, how was your nap? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I got to tell you, I said, I heard this popping sound and I thought I broke your neck. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I had a um, dirt bike accident years ago. It was probably my sternum. My sternum popped really easily. I thought, my God, you <laughs> son of a bitch. So because I had so much adrenaline pumping through my body, thinking I just killed a man, I go over and just attack the shit out of these watermelons. This is super easy. Bang, bang, bang. Crush him. You know, he recorded it. And then, of course that's when all that stuff went viral. And then I developed like a, you know, at home eight week leg program to teach women how to crush watermelons <laughs> because then, you know, it became a, a talking point of female strength. Cause I'm yeah. like, look, right. You know, this is like, we're built for this. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> if you've had kids, you can certainly crush a watermelon. So it was a, it was definitely a, a turning point that, but yeah, being in that underground world, truly helped me realize that the world is not what we think it is, right? Because mm -hmm. I had clients who were cops, federal judges, rock stars, you know, people who were in positions of power, but also not, you know, computer programmers, car mechanics, um, college students, you know, it was just this massive array of different backgrounds, socioeconomic status, um, you know, uh, different parts of the world. Like I said, I'd see guys from all over the Middle East, right? And it's like, which was really interesting because lift and carry is like a really massive thing out there. I don't know why. One day I would love to figure it out, but I'm like, this is so bizarre. Like, why are, is everybody from your country into getting picked up and carried around? It's, it's, it's a very, very fascinating thing. So to really help me understand that, you know, the the media is really powerful, and there is an agenda there and it's because they want to sell us something in order to, to, you know, they create a, a void to make you feel like you're not whole if you don't have this, mm. right? So you need to buy this to look like that. And, um, you know, again, it was, it was a huge, huge eye opener for me to be like, oh my gosh, there's people out there who find hairy armpits beautiful. This is bizarre. <laughs> And again, this was really before social media became a huge thing. I mean, Facebook was around, but um, not like as it is today, as we know it, you know, where mm -hmm. it consumes our entire life. So that was, that was a big, that was a big deal for me. Eye opener. And until you are, you experience something, you don't really realize, you know, 
how how the world is. Listeners, go to the show notes. I'm going to put links to Courtney's website. Yes, she did talk about crushing watermelons. I'll put a link to a video and to her girl clothing line. So go to the show notes to get connected with there. Let's dive in deep on something else here, as I have an idea that there may be a correlation here. Mm. Is trauma related to women in bodybuilding? I would say absolutely yes. Yes. 100%. 100%. In my experience, most women that I have met in this industry have had, yeah, some level of trauma and you know and to to be frank i feel like most women have some kind of story you know um it's just those of us that go that route you know i I definitely think that trauma is a driving force Mm -hmm. and it's a, a form of empowerment and to to feel strong and you know I'm fuckable with, if you will. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I I would definitely say so. Courtney, how do you build a new level of confidence or a mindset that you can, as your book says, crushing it, that you can crush anything? It's great. Another great question. So building confidence is, again, like I said, being of service is a big one, Mm -hmm. but also taking responsibility for your life, you know, Mm -hmm. not playing victim and thinking, Oh, well, you would do this too. If you had my life, you know, it's making the conscious decision to do something different and to be the master of your, all your outcomes. Right. So saying, all right, I'm going to take responsibility for what I put into my body, how I treat my body and own that. You know, and once you decide to do that and know that nobody's going to come to save you, then that's when you can start your journey, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and being proactive. And really, there's no barriers at at this stage in life because there's so much content out there for free. You know, all you have to do is just go and and look from between blogs and YouTube and, you know, ebooks, free courses, like people have so much stuff to offer that, you know, you could literally decide to pick up anything and and learn. It's almost so. like you got to start with the person in the mirror. You got to have that hard conversation with yourself to learn to put some things aside so you don't put up obstacles or hurdles to make sure that you don't succeed. Correct. So you got to have, you got to have those tough conversations with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't be delusional about it. That's for sure. And I think you got to get to the point too, where, where you're ready, you know, cause mm-hmm. it's easy to get comfortable and make excuses. And, you know, once you hit, and everybody's rock bottom is a little different, whether that's like a depression or, you know, you get to a point in your marriage where you decide, you know, it's time to get divorced and it's really uncomfortable. Um, yeah. And, and people fear change. You know, oh. we, we really do. We're just creatures of habit. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You got to You got to get realistic with yourself for sure. When you hear the word cellulite, what do you think of? <laughs> cellulite. Yeah, cellulite. <laughs> I think of the world's greatest scandal, the world's greatest marketing campaign. I forget what the details are, but it was actually a made up word from like Vogue or something like that from the 50s, I believe. And, you know, it was just created in the the industry to again sell you something because so many women have it, you know, and it's something that you don't unless you're like severely taxing your body to the point where, you know, you're, you're doing what I was doing, like CrossFit, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Bikram yoga, (laughs) all in the same day, which is not healthy. You know, there is hyper gymnasia and that's an, that's a real, um, form of disordered eating. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the biggest, lie ever. And I mean, there's, I'm in the best shape of my life and 
externally, I should say, because internally, you know, I've been battling with perimenopause, Graves disease, and, um, you know, I've, I've got a lot of stuff going on there, but externally, I mean, you know, you know, you can't see me, but I've got veins popping out of 16 inch biceps and And she's not kidding. Trust me, people. (laughs) (laughs) I've got a black eye from jujitsu yesterday. Like I'm out there rolling with guys, you know, three times my size and holding my own. And it's very empowering. But, um, that being said, I still have cellulite on the back of my left leg. It's just there. You know, I look at my mom and my mom, you know, she's not, she, she's great, but she doesn't, she's great now. We get along now. (laughs) (laughs) Wasn't always that way, but, um, you know, she, she has a ton of it on her legs. And I, I know that that's, it's hereditary, you know, it's just something that some of us are a lot of women have, and even some men, not as much, obviously, but it, and it's something that hinders so many women, you know, I know for myself included, like I would see just a little bit before I got to this point of body acceptance and it would just ruin my entire day, you know? And I'm like, nobody else gives a shit. They really don't. You just care what's on yourself. So, and that was set up by design to keep us, you know, especially as I tell white women, right? Because, you know, women of color, like they've got a whole other host of problems to think about, you know? Um, And that took me a long time to realize as well, because as a white person, you don't have the same experiences. You don't have the same, you know? (laughs) So I remember the first time (laughs) I heard... I heard the word white white privilege, and I was like, "Ah, fuck you! You don't know about my life." (laughs) I had sexual assault. I got so offended, and it literally took me like six months to unpack that. And one day, I was like, "Oh, that's right. If I get pulled over, you know, I can say, you know, this cop says, you know, why I pulled you over? I could say, yeah, because I'm packing guns, (laughs) haha. And I could flirt and talk my way out of it. But you know, there are." women of color who get pulled over and they say some shit like that, they're going to wind up with their face down in the dirt. Right. You know? So it just, it it took me a while to, to unpack that. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you know? So, but as, as white women, you know, I I think it's something that we are so obsessed with because it's like, it, it consumes all of our mental faculties. So we can't sit and actually put our, energy towards things that really matter like solving fucking world hunger or you know <laughs> stuff that actually stuff that actually matters matters you know? to something right yeah yes. and now it's just like we're all so numb to everything that's going on and i see parents nowadays just give their kids tablets or phones and i'm like wow you really have no idea uh, or kids trying to play with them while they're on their phone And, um, you know, I talked about earlier how zero to seven or zero to eight, we aren't fully conscious yet. And we're creating all these limiting beliefs. And so, you know, I'll give you a quick example. Do you have a sibling? I do. Older, younger? Younger. I have two younger. Younger brother, younger sister. Okay. So the next youngest one from you, how many years younger? Two. Okay, perfect. So let's, and what's their name? Tim. Tim. Okay. So Tim is... uh, one year old and you're three and you're trying to tie your shoe for the first time. And Tim is in his high chair and your mom is in, was your mom around growing up? Oh yeah. Okay. So mom's in the kitchen cutting up an apple or something. And she looks up and you say, mom, help. You can't tie your shoe and you're looking for her help. And she looks over at Tim and Tim's standing up in his high chair at this point, about to fall forward out of his high chair. And she says to you, hold on, Tommy, I'll be right there. And she runs over to Tim and grabs him and and gets him situated in his high chair. In that moment, what's the potential belief that you'd created about yourself? That I can't tie my shoes. (laughs) That, yeah. But what else? I don't know. What, What could you draw from the fact that your mom went over to Tim first before you that he's more important than me. Exactly. Exactly. And is that true? No, no. Correct. It's just, your mom didn't want a massive ass hospital bill or potentially deal with the fact that, Oh, well, Tim died. Tough way to go down. (laughs) Right. But she doesn't know that you've just created this belief. 
And you don't realize that the belief you just created is in fact not true. But it's quite easy to draw that conclusion based off of the circumstances without a conversation, right? But you're fully, we're creating beliefs from within the womb. So that's why, you know, you see parents reading to babies in the womb and, you know, it's super important. And in fact, let me say this resource before I forget. There's a book called The Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton, which is, he's a um, metaphysicist, quantum physics guy. Like he is the godfather of epigenetics, right? So um, nurture over nature, that that whole thing. So it it was super eye-opening book, but learning about the power of beliefs. You know, my favorite quote, whether you think you can or you think you can't, either way, you're right. Henry Ford, Mm -hmm. you know, and reading the book, um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, you know, he was um, commissioned to interview all of the millionaires back in the 30s. And what was their secret to success? And they're, they're all talking about the same thing. It's about having a white hot belief in something. So um, these beliefs that we create are, are so powerful. So um, again, a lot of our programming comes from ages zero to seven years old, or let's say your dad's pushing you, you know, you just took your training wheels off your bike for the first time and he's pushing behind you and he lets go and you're pedaling, you're going yourself. But then you turn around and you don't see your dad behind you and you create the belief that, oh, he's never there for me. He abandoned me. It's like, is that true? No. No. Dip shit. (laughs) But you don't know the difference. Right. And so when we think like, well, why can't, you know, we used to not be able to rent a car before the age of 25. Boys in particular, because you guys develop, your brains develop slower. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and here we are putting our kids on fucking social media at (laughs) age five explain (laughs) that you know what i mean like give me a fucking break like we are destroying the future of civilization you know and everybody is like what's the number one sought after career now is to be a a content creator or a celebrity you know meanwhile in china kids want to be astronauts Mm. make it make sense you know tiktok is it's i don't know i have some very strong beliefs about the direction in which we're heading. But again, (laughs) parents need to take responsibility for their kids and actually know what the fuck is going on in their lives and understand, you know, how to best be there for them and and show love and show support. And, you know, it was difficult as it was before the boom of social media. And now it's like, (laughs) so anyway, that's right. Tell my (laughs) listeners about your billion dollar brand girl clothing leggings, which is the world's first and most size inclusive athletic brand. Yeah. I love that part. You really did your homework. I'm impressed. You know, I've been on a ton of podcasts and you are great at interviewing people. I'm just put that out there. Thank you. (laughs) You were welcome. Uh, Girl clothing. Yeah. It actually started out So backing up, my husband was the CEO of a national rugby team in Australia, you know, so it'd be like the equivalent of the Raiders or the 49ers. Okay. It's a huge, it's it's their sport out there. And um, aside from AFL, Australian football, um, but I had, I, I was an assistant strength training coach for the under 20s team or the under 18s. And um, I had decided that I wanted to mentor teenage girls because I wanted to, you know, I I looked at my life, right. And as a middle-class white, relatively privileged girl who, you know, went to a private Catholic high school, I wound up. So my senior year, I was supposed to be the first female president of the United States. That was my ambition since I was very small. And by time I got to my senior year of high school, you know, I was the ASB president, captain of the cheerleading team, started the first girls golf team, Eureka city youth council in a Christian rock band. You know, I was, I was 4.0 GPA. I was going places. I started smoking meth Mm. and I kept doing it because I lost weight and, you know, having bad body image and body dysmorphia since I was a small girl, I thought I found the Holy grail. And instead, you know, pissed everything away. Now, fast forward, um, you know, and of course, in that in that time, I had experienced sexual assault from my boxing trainer, who was supposed to be my mentor, 
you know, after I was like three days clean and, uh, you know, spiraling out of control and then developing alcoholism and all this kind of stuff. And then finding the muscle fetish industry or the muscle kink industry. (laughs) And in that time making, you know, a lot of content. So I had videos that were on an adult only website, even though it wasn't any adult content. Like it was me arm wrestling guys, crushing watermelons, you know, all that kind of stuff. It wasn't anything that I would be concerned if my dad came across. Right. But because I was associated with this adult only website, what happened was, is I had, I said, all right, I want to work with teenage girls. I filled out an application to mentor uh, with big brother, big sister. And then a reporter found out that I have a different last name than my husband did some digging around on the internet, found a couple topless photos of me, found my old clip store on this website and wrote this headline that said CEO hires or CEO. Yeah. Hires X. No. What did it say? CEO hires ex fetish porn star wife to train the under twenties. And they gathered these pictures off of my Facebook and it, the way they positioned it, I mean, it just looked so raunchy. And then he went in to all of my background, you know, I was sexually assaulted. It was a drug addict, alcoholic, all this kind of stuff. And just, just drug me through the mud basically. And what happened was this story got syndicated. So this Mm. was my next life lesson and learning how powerful the media is. And this was back in 2012. And I think this was like the media was owned by six corporations back then. And now it's like four. So to see this go into like Denmark, the UK, New Zealand, India, right? So people sending me pictures of the newspaper and I'm like, how? How is this news? Like, this isn't news. This is insane. And why? And why exactly? Where, you know, and then seeing also how women are portrayed in the media, because when in New Zealand, a football player, it was for a uh, rugby union. If he was an all blacks player, he actually married a porn star and the whole country was like high fiving him, you know, great job. And then when my husband, you know, gets drugged through the mud as well and like how irresponsible of you how could you do this because women were like i don't want that slut training my son and like yeah okay what do you think your son's doing in the locker room reading a science magazine (laughs) no anyway but you know i i had also just watched there was a documentary um by a woman named jean kilborn called killing us softly and she talks about how women are portrayed in the media. And she's been having the same talk since the 1970s. And sure enough, after watching that, I noticed like all the commercials in Australia, all the women are like, you know, changing diapers, cleaning the toilet, dropping the kids off at school. And all the men are barbecuing, changing tires on their car, going to Forex Island and drinking beer. You know, I was like, holy shit, this is this is wild. Like, but until you have the awareness, you don't pick up on it. It just seems normal. You know what I mean? But then once you're in the center of it Mm. and you're framed as an ex fetish porn star, cause I was like, well, clearly I missed that paycheck. Okay. (laughs) As far as I know, porn stars are, are pretty rich. Uh, That's not me. So anyway, carry on. But you know, when all this stuff was happening and I was like being drugged through the mud, I was okay because I had just finished working most of my steps, you know, working a 12 step program and I knew who the fuck I am, right? You could call me a sheep fucker for all I cared. I know at the end of the day, I have not fucked any sheep. You could say what you want, you know, paint me in any light you care to. I know when I put my head on my pillow at night, I'm a good person and where I've been, where I'm going, how I'm getting there, who's going with me. I did the work. You know, I put pen to paper. I've I've spent a lot of time reflecting on, you know, that's why you work steps, all the shit you screwed up, you know, you make your amends, you know, how can you do better, make uh, wrong the right or right the wrongs. And um, it wasn't until Big Brother Big Sister called me uh, mid January because Australia shuts down for Christmas for like proper three weeks. And they said, Hey, we got your application, Courtney. We think it's great what you're doing. Sadly, unfortunately, we can't work with you because of what's going on in the media. And that's when I was like, Oh my God, 
oh, poor me. I, you know, what everybody said was right. I am a piece of shit and I don't deserve anything. And I, you know, had a good solid cry for 10, 15 minutes. And then I had what I call a God shot. And it was just like this intervention of something that, you know, I had the word no flash before me. And it was just like a wet washcloth hit me in the face. And it was like, no, fuck you. I'm going to create my own program started by people who've been there and done that and not just read it out of a textbook. And that's essentially what I did from that day moving forward. I sat at my kitchen table and I created a dissonance-based program called Camp Confidence, where we taught the five habits, lessons, and principles that lead to the development of self-love for teenage girls. Mm -hmm. So it was ages 13 to 17. And essentially I took everything I wish I was taught in school and gave them like a real life education over the course of a 48 hour period. I was you know, almost 72, but anyway, and we did that for two years and we had 62 graduates and these girls were actively cutting themselves, you know, severely bullied, um, some drugs and alcohol eating disorders. And by the end of the weekend, they had this amazing transformation. And one of my partners got pregnant and in the downtime, cause I'm sitting there like, you know, trying to figure out how do I scale this? You know, like, uh, there's only one of me, like, what can I, what, what do I do? How do I train the trainer? How, how do we get this into schools? I was upset that president Obama hadn't noticed me yet. <laughs> you know, he was in office at the time. And, um, my husband said, why don't you take the same vision and mission and roll that into a clothing line? And he said, and then you can talk to the world about body image and, you know, women empowerment, as opposed to 12 teenage girls every other weekend in a tiny corner of Australia. And so we had this thing I wrote called the pledge where these girls, after they did this module on body image and, you know, understanding how, again, females are portrayed in the media, they would take this thing called the pledge and it says, I solemnly swear to the best of my ability to refrain from talking negatively about myself as well as other girls. I'm an equal amongst my peers, and I do not see myself as neither better than nor less than. Through this pledge of non-judgment, I understand and embrace that I'm having a positive impact on the world and furthering the global revolution of body acceptance. So they take this big mouthful, and then they would get this little silicon band that said confidence, you know, camp confidence mm -hmm. on it with K's, of course. Cause we've got to be special because I'm Courtney <laughs> with a cake. Thanks mom. <laughs> and, uh, then when they were out on the street, you know, if they ran into another girl that had the band, they knew straight away that that was their sister and not their competition because teenage girls are so brutal towards each other. Right. So they would understand the importance of sisterhood, why we're held back as a gender. It's because we see each other as competition and they had this new sense of a, you know, a rally cry and it happened. A few girls did end up running into each other and, and had a moment where they're like, Oh my God, you know, and they were instant friends. So it was super powerful. So I thought, why don't we take that? And, and now that pledge is on all of our hang tags. So it's really the cornerstone and the ethos of girl clothing. So the silicone band has now become the shirt or the leggings you know, and as soon as you see another girl in girl clothing, you know that you're cut from the same cloth and you understand, you know, and we do our best to incorporate this into our everyday life and practice it. So if you come across something, except for Kim Kardashian, talk all the shit you want about her. I don't care. <laughs> but generally speaking, you know, if there's something that another woman does that you don't agree with, you don't approve of, you don't like cool, whatever, you know, there's old adage of, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. We really imply that and do our best to lift each other up. So it's really the, the clothing is secondary to the mission and vision, you know, which is to empower other women and to create a sisterhood and to have each other's back and, you know, really create this global network of women who are, who are down, you know, um, so that's, that's where the clothing line came from. And of course we do things differently, right? So our point of difference is, is we don't use sizing. We use athletes names and body types because women's sizing is so screwed up and was developed by a dude in the 1940s from the department of agriculture. So, you know, in Nike, you could be a small Reebok, you could be a large, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so being an e-commerce brand, we want women to 
go off of your actual measurements. And then instead of being like a, a number, you're looking at a strong, powerful athlete, you know? So I'm a, I'm a size Kim who uh, is a WWE wrestler or um, I'm a size Heidi who is Canada's arm wrestling champion. That is you know, awesome. Size Cameron. Yeah. She's an Olympic hammer thrower, you know, it's crazy. So it, it just that's doing really away cool. With it. That's really cool. Yeah. It's, it's been, a, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> listeners again so, go to the clo- or to the show notes i'm going to put a link to girl clothing leggings three boys so. sweats for the guys when i was yeah. doing research and i came across this story i thought that's exactly how i'm ending this interview about being catcalled by a man who was in a car with no license plates and blackout windows <laughs> tell that story yeah <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was awesome. I was walking back from CrossFit and of course, you know, Vegas is super hot and I had on, you know, booty shorts essentially in a sports bra and he was, yeah, he was cat calling me, like, you know, and I, I actually, first I was walking and I saw him drive by and then I saw him drive by again because I'm constantly paying attention to my surroundings you know, I'm, I'm always switched on, um, paying attention, not in a, um, panicked way, but just observing, you know, mm-hmm. and again, I think that comes from trauma. Cause I sure. constantly am like, you know, thinking of people having guns and mm-hmm. <laughs> so it happens when you grow up with an alcoholic, <laughs> <laughs> but I saw him and he pulled over. And at that point, I think I had like crossed the street. And he kept calling and I was like, all right, I'm going over there. Screw it. <laughs> so yeah, I went over and I was like, are you cat calling me? And he was like, well, yeah, you know, that's what we do in my country. We, you know, that I'm like, no, it's not. I said, like, let me break this down for you. I was like, he didn't have, I'm like, you don't have a license plate. Your windows are blacked out. And I was like, most women are going to find this super intimidating. Like you're going to throw me in the back of your car. Mm-hmm. I said, me, I was like, have you seen the woman that crushed this watermelons between her legs? <laughs> I said, so I'm not afraid. I will do that to your head, you know, bring it on. (laughs) And that is kind of the attitude I've taken into life. And it's bizarre. And hopefully one day it doesn't bite me in the ass. And if it does, at least, you know, we said it here first and your podcast will become super famous. (laughs) I'm always like, you know what? Try me. I will fuck you up. (laughs) If I don't, I will die. I will die trying, even though there's no try. (laughs) But, um, You know, I I said, and instead of being a bitch about it, right, because in my experience, if you belittle somebody or you make somebody feel stupid, they're not going to receive the information. They're going to be in a state of embarrassment and shame, and it's just going to bounce right off of them. So you got to meet people where they're at. And I was like, look, dog, you know, I should talk to him like a homeboy. I was like, look here, dude. I was like, this isn't it. I'm like, I'm trying to help you get back in the game. Do not cat call women. It's gross. Like, you know, come up and be like, damn, you look strong or wow. How do I get my legs to be your size? You know, mm-hmm. uh, compliment a woman on something like that. I don't fucking this you idiot. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, look, I'm just trying to help you get in the game and, you know, improve, improve yourself instead of being like, you know, an ass about it. I've been in situations, like I said, I I brought up this, this notion of um, white privilege. And like I said, when I was learning about this stuff and unpacking it, there were times when I do something like I reposted, there was this young black girl who was talking about um, the discrepancies and in terms of, you know, the number of black girls who were injured and I I can't remember the exact gist of it but basically I took her talking and reposted it but then I put what they call my white lens on it and I was trying to compare it to my lived experience like so living as a white person in Southeast Asia you know and sure enough like yeah you don't see yourself represented like in Singapore when I lived in Singapore you know they'd have um, Singapore day and it's like oh countries were coming together as one, but not a single white person anywhere, you know, um, or you'd, you'd go like certain airlines and they just ignore you. And so anyway, 
I, I tried to put that context onto her lived experience. And I'd have, you know, a girl who was a woman who was kind of mentoring me say, you know, I know you're trying to do well, but you need to delete that because, you know, X, Y, and Z. And I would be like, well, shit, I'm just trying to help, you know, and I'd get embarrassed or Mm -hmm. my ego would get pissed off instead of just saying, okay, no problem. I'll do better next time. Right. Right. So, and she wasn't even coming at me like in a way to make me feel bad. It's just my ego was so wrapped up in it. Right. So again, you got to meet people where they're at and, and go in a way to come out with a win-win situation and not be just a winner yourself. Like you want to take other people with you. So you all win, you know? Agree. Courtney, yeah. thanks so much for taking time out of your schedule. I know you're really busy and spending some time with me on my podcast. This has been fun and I'm grateful for the deep conversation as well. <laughs> me too, Tommy. Thanks for having me. It's been an honor. You are more than welcome. Listeners, make sure you go to the show notes. You follow me on Instagram at Before the Lights Podcast. And do me a favor. Take 30 seconds out of your day. Go rate, review, and follow the show to help me grow the show immensely. Until next time, I'm Tommy Canale. Thank you for listening to Before the Lights. A salute. A chin chin. <laughs>